Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true, but most stuff is in the plane. Um, yeah, mo most of our space mass is, is in the plane. Uh, really good point. You had me worried for a minute. Uh, so, so these saddle points are really interesting. They actually, if you wanted an efficient space mission, the best thing you could do is try to, to connect these saddle points. Because then if I just push myself on one side, I go to one area. If I push myself on the other, I go to the other area. And so that's why people were looking at this. They could conceptualize this interplanetary transport network of these invariant manifold tubes connecting all of the different saddle points. So the Earth and the Moon have five saddle, have five Lagrange points. Two, uh, L1 and L2 are saddles. The Earth and the Sun have a bunch of fixed points. Two of them, you know, L1 and L2 are saddles. The Sun and Jupiter, the Sun and Mars, Jupiter and its moon. So there's all of these saddle points floating around in the solar system. And what you could potentially do is catch one of these highways and make an efficient, you know, wait until it connects to the saddle point of another planet. And this is a real thing that you can do. So for example, um, in the US, this was called the Jupiter Icy Moon Orbiter, the GMO mission, because we wanted to go uh, check out all of the icy moons of Jupiter, because that'd be awesome, but we don't know what we're gonna find. So you're gonna orbit one moon, maybe it's super boring. Okay, they like don't do anything interesting on that moon. And so what you wanna do is adaptively change your mission to go hop to another moon. And if that one's really, really interesting, you might wanna stay there for 10 or 20 or 30 orbits. And then you wanna hop another tube to a different moon. And you wanna do this as efficiently as possible. You do it by using the saddle points in the system. We didn't pick it up in the US. Um, I believe the European Space Agency did. Now it's called JUICY, which I think is a much better acronym, the JUICY mission. Um, but it's all based on the saddle points. It's exactly the same uh, conceptual dynamics that allows me to walk efficiently is now allowing space mission design to be efficiently uh, designed. And we can also harness these in fluids, right? So for fluid flow control, saddle points are, are really, really important. Okay, these are the mediators where you can go, you know, in very different directions with very little input. Okay, so when I was learning about, uh, you know, space mission designs, chaotic dynamical systems, I always thought that if you increase the complexity and the dimensionality of the system, then you could only get chaotic, disordered mess. And that's not true. So there's this great video I wanna show you. Um, I hope this is playing. Of all of these metronomes on a plank. Let me make sure it's playing. Okay, so someone's gonna come and kick all these metronomes. So this is a high dimensional nonlinear dynamical system, bunch of oscillators. And what you're gonna find Notice that the board is a little bit compliant. It can bend a little. You can do this at home. You can take two cans of, of, uh, of soda and a wooden board and you'll get enough coupling to do this. So this starts out in a very disordered state. They're all different phases. But very rapidly you actually see that pattern is forming. In fact, it's almost happened. You can now feel that there are two basic groups. Okay, they've completely fallen into line. This is a little creepy. Um, I turn this, <laughs> I turn the sound down. Um, it's ominous to see everybody fall into line. Okay, and just a small amount, a weak epsilon nonlinear coupling to these oscillators causes them to lock on with each other. Okay, this is a well-known phenomenon in, in high-dimensional oscillators, yes? But the clock workers have known already in 1600 to make their clocks look much more accurately than they really were there to put them on, 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 on a wooden uh, um, 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 plate. And this way they would synchronize and this way they would all flow at the same time. For a long period of Regardless of what, whether the time was right or wrong, they were all in, in agreement. <laughs> um, and now, I mean, look at this. They are completely in lockstep. Um, I'm gonna fast forward just a little bit. Okay, I have no idea 
Is there one that's out of phase? Yeah, this one's my hero. <laughs> but this is a three minute video. Um, so you can imagine what happens at the end of, of three minutes. Okay, so it's not all chaos and disorder and uncertainty. You can also have epsilon nonlinearities forcing synchronization and creating this order, kind of this emerging order uh, in the system. Uh, I think someone had a question. Yeah. Sorry, in the in which figure? Uh, the planets? Yes. One previous slide. With the planets? Yes. Okay. Uh, one after, yeah. So there is a green ribbon of some sort that's being shown. Oh, this is an artist rendition. It just looks better. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, like that would be your that would be your you know your trajectory on this thing. So th this is an invariant manifold. It, you're, it's an invariant tube. If you're inside, you can't get outside without spending energy. And then these green things would essentially be like a given trajectory on that tube over here. So it's just a trajectory, like a stylized trajectory. Yeah. Well. Did they all have the same frequency? Can anything actually have the same frequency? I mean, you know, yes, they're all metronomes. They're all the same frequency. Um, but, you know, in principle, there's uncertainty. They're not exactly the same frequency. And so there, this is a very, very well-studied system, actually. Uh, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of papers written on synchronization. Um, and there are lots of well-known results about how strong the nonlinearity can be, what is the range of uncertainty and the frequencies that will cause them to lock on or not lock on. Um, actually, Benjamin Herman knows a lot more about this than I do, uh, kind of the synchronization effects in, in coupled oscillator systems. Uh, very, very well studied in lots and lots of different applications. So these metronomes do have the same frequencies, uh, same natural frequencies, but you could detune them a little bit and still get the same behavior. Yeah, that's called like lock on. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a little funny, right? Like if I had, imagine that I had all of these clocks in different rooms and different cities across the country, right? Um, so, you know, this one's in Paris and this one's in Berlin and this one's in Seattle. They're not gonna synchronize, right? There's no reason why they would synchronize. They synchronize because this, they're on this board and this board is causing just a tiny amount of epsilon coupling so that when if one is out of phase, it feels a restorative force trying to bring it into phase with the other ones. So uh, how many of you have heard of the Millennium Bridge in uh, London? That super cool, you know, bridge over, uh, over the Thames. The minute that, you know, they opened it up to people, people started walking on it. They noticed this tiny sway but what, you, what do you do when you're on a bridge that sways? You like hunker down a little and you brace against it. And so you have 10,000 people bracing against in order and this is what happens. And they almost, um, you know, they had to shut the bridge down. So, you know, uh, the, people have known this forever in, uh, in the army, right? When you walk across a bridge, you break step or else you break bridge. So, okay, good. So for the last five or 10 minutes, I'm just gonna tell you some cool stuff about mixing, um, bring nonlinear dynamical systems into fluids a little. So this is kind of a neat video I made when I was in grad school. Um, what you see here, this is basically a flat plate plunging up and down in a very viscous fluid. You can think of it like honey, um, or maybe this is the wing of a fruit fly. Air is very viscous to a fruit fly. And you're creating these large recirculation zones. And you can see that after many, many periods of oscillation, you get this kind of chaotic uh, mixing, 
you get a lot of mixing happening in the system. So if I started in two different places right next to each other, I might end up in very different, uh, different regions of the flow after, after this pumping motion. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about these, these unsteady manifolds that I'm visualizing here. This is just a slide I made. Um, you know, I'm simulating the 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equation with a code that Sam Tyra and Tim Colonius wrote, the immersed boundary projection code. You can download this. Um, and you get these beautiful visualizations for, this is an airfoil plunging up and down. This is an airfoil pitching about its quarter cord. And these visualizations look a lot like the classic smoke visualization that you would see. And in fact, that is exactly what these are, is showing if I had dropped smoke, if I put a cigarette in this, this virtual wind tunnel, this is where the smoke would collect. Okay, but we're doing it mathematically uh, in a simulation. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about what that, that is. Uh, this is called the finite time Lyapunov exponent field. And so Berndt said that you get chaos when you have a positive Lyapunov exponent. That means there's some unstable direction that's amplifying uncertainty. Uh, what a finite time Lyapunov exponent means is that over a finite time horizon, two initial conditions are massively separating almost exponentially in time. And so uh, the finite time layoff on an exponent essentially generalizes this idea of stable and unstable manifolds from my nonlinear dynamical system I showed you. Remember I have this, uh, this red stable manifold here where material would attract onto that red stable manifold. That's exactly what these uh, red curves are for time varying fluid flows. So they're the, time, they're the unsteady analog of stable and unstable manifolds from dynamical systems. Um, and I'll tell you how you compute these. So the way I think about this is, okay, Navier-Stokes equation is a dynamical system. I have some vector field U, my velocity field, and U sub T, my time derivative of U equals some nonlinear function, uh, you know, diffusion, convection. If I dropped a particle in my fluid flow, it also sees a dynamical system. So the particle position is x, f is my uh, fluid velocity field, and f, this really should be varying in time because my flow is unsteady. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow that particle through this vector field by integrating it along the flow field, getting this flow map. Okay, so I'm, I'm walking my white particles forward in time. Along, uh, along the flow. In fact, that's actually what you're seeing here is I started with a grid of particles and I integrate them forward or backward in time. And what these red ridges are is if I took those white particles and I integrated them backward in time, the red ridges would be where two neighboring points separated the most in backward time. Kind of hard to compute, very easy to say. I literally drop a big grid of particles, I integrate them backward in time, and I look at which particles separated the most. That's what I color red. Okay? And what that means is that, so that's a movie in reverse. Then when I flow that movie forward, those, those points that had separated the most in backward time, that's where everything attracts onto. That's how smoke visualization works. All of the smoke attracts onto those vortex structures. Okay, and that's why you get these cool filaments. So the way you actually compute this is you create a grid of particles, you integrate them all forward or backward in time, you zoom in, this is just a zoom in to four neighboring particles in a stencil here. So these four neighboring particles might have flowed here. Sorry, you can't read this at all. Uh, but these four particles stretched in some directions and compressed in others. And that you can approximate this, uh, the Jacobian of this flow map using finite difference derivatives of these few, uh, final positions with respect to these initial pos positions. This is a matrix of partial derivatives. And then you look at the maximum singular vector, a singular value, you take the singular value decomposition of this matrix, and the largest singular value tells you how much those particles stretched in time. And the regions that have the largest singular value are the ones that I color red here. 
Okay, that's how you compute these finite time Lyapunov of exponents. And so these are super duper useful in fluids to tell you lots of interesting things about what the flow is doing. This is a video uh, by Shadden, Debiri, and Marsden. This is one of my absolute favorites. They measured the flow field behind a jellyfish, and then they integrated uh, like imaginary particles forward and backward in time to find these, uh, these Lagrangian coherent structures. And what this does is it explains that the blue fluid stay that starts on the outside stays on the outside. It gets shed into this propulsive wake. That's how it moves forward. And all of this green material that started on the inside gets entrained into the bell. This is how they eat. And so this is the first visualization that, from a dynamical systems perspective, explained how jellyfish simultaneously propel themselves and feed with the same periodic motion. Okay. Uh, this one's really cool. This is also uh, John DeBerry and Kit Parker, um, Caltech and Harvard. So they decided to take this idea and build a robo jellyfish. So they implanted um, cardiac cells from a rat onto this little mold, and they put this in a dielectric fluid and pulsed it, and they created a robotic jellyfish. Uh, they call it a medusoid jellyfish. And now they're gonna turn the pacing on, and they've created this little jellyfish. Very cool. I really, really like this video. But they understand a lot more about the physics of the system by analyzing these Lagrangian coherent structures, these, these, uh, these regions where the Lyapunov exponent is positive for some amount of time. So unfortunately, a lot of our understanding of these dynamical systems is to understand how to dump pollution. I, I'm not kidding. A lot of our understanding about dynamical systems and fluids comes from uh, either we accidentally dumped a bunch of pollution or we want to dump a bunch of pollution, but we don't want it to stay near where we live. Uh, and so, you know, this is a video of the Gulf oil spill. So you can compute those, those regions of separation or attraction, and you can figure out where is the oil going to attract to, where is it going to repel from? And actually you get very good predictions of where the oil plume will be. This is Monterey Bay in California, one of the most beautiful bays in the world. And they asked a very simple logical question. If we're going to dump our pollution into Monterey Bay, where should we dump it so that it goes out <laughs> and doesn't recirculate? I mean, this is crazy. But this is uh, where this came from. And you can see this large recirculation region here separated by this manifold. So if you were dumb enough to dump pollution in Monterey Bay, you would dump it to the left of this jut because then it'll go to the ocean. And if you dumped it to the right, it's just going to recirculate in the bay for a really, really long time. And anytime you go to a river, uh, you see this. You see the scum on the side that just recirculates there forever. Okay, Those are, are quantities that you can pull out from dynamical systems analysis. Those are uh, from the manifolds. And I'll point out that these also tell you where you would control your flow, where you would want to put an actuator if you wanted to get the most change in your flow, those are given by these, these positively Lyapunov exponent regions. Okay, so that brings us back to this original uh, figure that I showed you at the very beginning. Uh, you can use these for full coupled climate simulations, and people are doing that right now. Um, you can use this to figure out where uh, the ocean is mixing a lot, where it's not, where someone is going to get you know, pulled out to sea. They use this for rescue missions now. Um, on, on coastal regions and all kinds of interesting things. Okay, that's everything I have for dynamical systems uh, right now, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you would like. Questions? Okay, Baron has a question. I have a very simple question. So, how in principle there are myriad or a hierarchy of reduced order models which can describe something. And I think a challenge is f figuring out something like a good cost functional, uh, which, which 
really assesses what we want to have from these reduced order models. To some extent, determining the cost function or the quality function of a reduced order model is, is more difficult than the, than the actual construction. And any, any thoughts on that? So this is a fantastic point. Maybe I'll just re-say this. Um, so when I'm building a model of the world or of my system, there, it's not one model. There is a whole, there's infinitely many models I could build to describe more fidelity, but more expensive, less fidelity, but less expensive, you know, and every reduction in between. How do you pick the best one or the right one? And I think this is actually an excellent point, and that's going to segue very nicely into the second set, uh, lecture I'll give in the afternoon, is this idea that in model reduction or system identification, you have to be extremely clear about what you want your model, your reduced model to do. What is a figure of merit or an objective that says it was a good model or a bad model? Uh, and I completely agree with Berndt that writing down the right objective function, the right optimization problem is almost always the hard part. Solving the optimization problem is oftentimes like a standard algorithm you can download off of GitHub now. Okay, does everyone want coffee? One, one more question and then coffee. About the example with the metronome, um, has anybody actually controlled that? Because usually we know, it's a common thing, we know how the system is gonna end up. Has anybody tried to make it faster or would it be a crazy amount of energy to just make it go faster to the end state or to keep them out of phase? That's a really, really good question. Um, there is a vast literature of network control and the control of networked dynamical systems. Um, and I, I can't even begin to kind of outline that field. It's very large and I only know a very little bit about it. Um, people definitely think about control. A lot of times they think about um, malicious control or sabotage. So for example, our internet uh, system is a bunch, is a big network of coupled routers, okay? And could you design a control law to cause that network dynamical system to fail as fast as possible? Same thing with the power grid. Uh, so people think a lot about how robust your system is to targeted attacks versus random attacks. Um, that doesn't necessarily answer your question about the metronome specifically, um, but it's a huge field of study to understand the robustness uh, and manipulation of networked dynamical systems in general. And that's just a very simple toy network dynamical system that we use to test methods when we care about things like the power grid and the internet. Yep. So other questions, otherwise we go for the break. It seems we go for the break, then thanks again to Professor Pronto for this. Thanks. Thank you.